Peter, let's talk about another aspect of this uh, incursion by the Ukrainian military into Russian territory, and that is uh, the U.S. perspective on it. Uh, there's obviously sensitivity at the White House and at the Pentagon over the use by the Ukrainian military of uh, U.S. hardware, munitions and, and weaponry. Uh, what have you heard about that? How much pushback might the Ukrainian military get for this? Uh, because this is no longer firing a missile towards Russian territory to take out you know, uh, uh, munitions coming in towards Ukraine. This is actually boots on the ground holding territory in Russia. Well, there, you know, Mike, there's been a lot of criticism of the Biden-Harris administration's uh, policy towards Ukraine to essentially tie one hand behind their back and have the so-called drip, drip, drip approach to the release of weapons. We can think back to how long it took uh, to provide the Ukrainians with long-range uh, fires like the Atakums missile. This is a very powerful capability. The Ukrainians now have it. It just took two years to put that into the field. So this has been the general approach. I will flag that the Ukrainian um, military operation into Russian territory appeared to have caught most of the U.S. government on the back foot. We saw the State Department admit we had no idea this was going to happen. Uh, Don Cody, the uh, National Security uh, Communications Advisor to the White House, uh, said openly, yeah, we're asking the Ukrainians what's going on in order to get a better idea of their intentions. So the U.S. government was caught on the back foot of, uh, as a result of this operation. But it does look like the Ukrainians are at least using some U.S. equipment uh, for this fight. Again, fog of war. I've been seeing some videos don't know which what's confirmed or not we do we will learn more from the ukrainians about this bottom line the u.s government has not screamed bloody murder yet about the use of western equipment in this operation that's significant yeah do you believe the white house do you believe the state department when they say <laughs> we had no idea or are they just doing is that kabuki theater are they just you know acting as if they had no idea uh, not that I give them a lot of credit for being able to, to, to do that very well, but uh, to what degree do you think perhaps there was coordination and they just want plausible deniability to say, hey, we had no idea. Sorry about that. I think it's the latter. Plausible deniability is the phrase of the day when it comes to this operation. It's very difficult to assemble that much uh, that many military personnel, that much equipment, uh, having your long range fires right there on the border, ready to provide artillery cover to Ukrainian troops as they move into Russian areas. Uh, it's really difficult to hide that from our eyes in the sky, uh, let alone from our close relationships with the Ukrainian military. So I think plausible deniability is key here, especially since we're dealing with a nuclear armed state like Russia. It's better for the United States to claim ignorance now uh, and pretend to go sort out the questions. Now, if the uh, mm -hmm. State Department and the White House are being honest and they had no idea, well, that shows the Ukrainians mm -hmm. were really able to maintain intense operational secrecy in advance of this incursion. Yeah, maybe they were just confused over who to coordinate with at the White House. They're not sure who's in charge. That could be part of it. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so, okay, well, yeah, if 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 we genuinely didn't know about it, then that doesn't say much about our, our liaison on the ground uh, with the Ukrainian uh, forces. It doesn't say much about our SIGINT capabilities, our photo analysis, uh, our ability to understand, you know, what's happening on the battlefield. So um, I'm going to go with the notion that they, you know, there was some element of coordination, uh, but they don't want to be caught out being aware of and perhaps resourcing an incursion into Russia for obvious reasons. Uh, let's 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 play the game where we ask you a question that's basically impossible to answer, but I, I find it entertaining. Well, I love that. My favorite kind of game. Go yeah. for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go with six months from now. You you had mentioned six months earlier in our conversation. Where are we in this conflict in say six months' time, from your perspective? I think we have to take very seriously the possibility uh, that there, uh, the next presidential administration, whether or not it will be Donald Trump or Harris, uh, that next presidential administration is going to look for the question for an answer to the question, what does the end game look like? Remember the fight that Congress put up over the um, additional supplemental military support 
for Ukraine. I think we we got an indication that any future uh, acts of Congress for more billions in military assistance to Ukraine, something that I support, uh, but I think Congress is really reaching a, its limit there. The Europeans have stepped up, good for them, but without the United States Congress mm -hmm. providing additional billions of dollars to keep Ukraine in this fight, alongside with our allies, uh, I think either the Harris or Trump administration uh, are going to be looking for some kind of negotiated settlement. Trump has said he will solve this war on day one, possibly, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think there's some more complications involved. Uh, but again, that's wait, wait, where wait, wait, wait. You're saying, to... you're, wait, yeah, you're saying You're saying we may not be able to solve this conflict in one day? Uh, I think it shocking. might be more difficult, but... You know, Trump likes to use rhetorical hyperbole uh, to underscore a deeper point. I think that's what he was saying. And that's why I just see yeah. this move to grab and hold Russian territory as a new kind of chip uh, at, the, uh, at the negotiating table. It's also been very politically damaging, Mike, to Putin. Remember, Putin's whole regime is predicated mm -hmm. on the promise, I am the one who will keep you safe. I am the one who makes Russia strong and provides for your security. Now, with this occupation of Russian lands, we've seen the second time in six months. The first was a shocking terrorist attack unrelated to this event, but a shocking terrorist attack in, in Moscow six months ago. Uh, that rattled a lot of people. It showed that Putin's narrative was was it true? And now this event, there are a lot of Russians in the Kursk region who are asking themselves, is Putin really keeping me, me safe? My home just got bombed. I had to flee with my pets. Hey, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment, a really positive, nice and kind comment. That would be appreciated. And if you're not already subscribed to our channel, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our daily updates.